some, it's something you cited in your expert report, actually. Um, I it, didn't footnote it, though. It's uh, note 37. It's if if you'd like to look at it, it's tab at one has your expert report, and it's. I, I believe that that's the UCLA report. It, I, it would just help me to know that. Okay, for it's, sure, if you're it's going note to 37 about. on page 18. If you want to review that, to refresh your memory. It says Carpenter and Gates, 2008, Table 3. Oh, okay. So, that, yeah, that, that's a different one than what I was thinking of. Okay. All right. And, and that's consistent with Ms. Steer's experience, correct? Well, that, that some portion of lesbians and gay men report having been married in the past. Yes, I believe that is consistent with her, her uh, experience. All right, thank you. And, and please turn to tab 28 in the witness binder. Oh, and before I do that, Your Honor, I, I'd like to offer the portions of the transcript of Ms. Steer's deposition that I read as into evidence, as admissions. Well, I said no objection. Very well. All right, thank you. And uh, as I said, please turn to tab 28, and you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 1009. 1009, yes. Can you identify that document? Um, this is uh, an, or a uh, report from uh, researchers at UCLA uh, at the Williams Institute at that university titled Marriage, Registration, and Dissolution by Same-Sex Couples in the U.S., published in 2008. And, and who are listed as the authors of the report? Uh, Gary Gates, M.V. Lee Badgett, and Deborah Ho. All right, thank you. And please look at page 10 in the report. And you will see a figure at the bottom that says figure 5. Well, it's not just the bottom, it's half of the page. Percent previously married among individuals and couples who seek marriage or legal recognition. And and from the context, if you read above, it, it says it's talking of same-sex couples, individuals and same-sex couples who have been previously married. And you'll see for California, the percentage of males in couples seeking marriage or legal recognition is 20% who were previously married. And for, for women, it was 29%, correct? That's what it shows, yes. Yes, thank you. And again, so, so the fact that Ms. Steer was formerly married to an opposite-sex spouse is not particularly unusual, correct? Um, that's correct. All right, thank you. Now, Your Honor, or, or excuse me, uh, Professor Herrick, could you please turn to tab 28A in the witness binder? And, Your Honor, this is, again, the same thing with uh, Plaintiff Perry's deposition testimony. And the specific lines that I would like to read are on page 152 from 7 to 15. And I, I guess I'd like to ask uh, through the court plaintiff's counsel if they have any objection to my reading that. It's, uh, it's uh, page 152, lines 7 through 15. 152. Line 7 through 15, Your Honor. Subject to some time to obviously supplement with uh, counter designations um, under the rule of completeness, we, we won't object. 
Well, that. I was apropos that. I wonder, Mr. Nielsen, would you object to having the uh, question and then the entire answer read? Not at all. Not at all. And but, Your Honor, I'm not sure that for an admission that's the that counter. Uh, for an admission, I'm not sure that counter designations are, are appropriate. Well, I know, but completeness certainly is, and that's why I was suggesting maybe. So yeah, and the, if the it's just the question, the entire answer that that would be fine. But I, I'm just objecting to the idea of some supplemental designation down the road. <clears throat> right, and I will uh, read the question, and I guess the complete answer. Then would that would that be acceptable? I guess I'll be going back to page 151, line 22. It was, is that acceptable, Your Honor? That's. Okay. Could you could you explain a little bit as to how that well that's a pretty Hold on a second. Maybe you really need to go back to line 16 on 151. Yes, since that, since that sets the context. Yes, your honor. The question, did you go through a process in ultimately arriving at the conclusion that you were going to identify as a lesbian? Did it take place over time? Answer, it was a process. It took place over a period of time. Question. Could you explain a little bit as to how that process took place? Answer. Well, I guess for me, the earliest conscious memory I have, wondering if I might be a lesbian, was when I felt the strong attraction to a woman in college. And so, I, since I wasn't certain that it might just be a single incident or event or a single person, it took a few years after that point in time to continue to date or feel attracted to understand maybe this enduring date or feel attracted to understand maybe this enduring pattern in me. So I was aware for other people in the world they had made that decision. So there were people in the world who I might be like that were gay or lesbian or heterosexual, but I wasn't certain until I had enough excuse me, until I had, had enough other experiences to know that perhaps most likely I'm a lesbian. And after having a few years of experience I arrived at that conclusion and adopted that sexual orientation for myself. Is the phrase I adopted or and adopted that sexual orientation for myself. Does that surprise you in any way? Well, I think that what she's describing in this entire response is that idea that sexual orientation is generally understood by not only researchers but by uh, many lay individuals as involving an enduring pattern. And so I think what she's describing here is that she uh, experienced these attractions uh, as an enduring pattern and it was after recognizing this pattern in herself that she uh, uh, adopted the label of, of lesbian or that she decided that that was an appropriate way to identify herself. Right, thank you and, and your honor I'd like to move that portion of the transcript that I read into evidence as an admission. Well I assume no objection. All right, uh, Professor Herrick, please turn to tab 29 in the witness binder. And here you'll find an exhibit pre-marked DIX 1010. Do you uh, see that? Yes. Can you identify this document? Um, it's titled, A New Look at Women's Sexuality and Sexual Orientation. The authors are Linda Garnett's and Letitia Ann Peplau, and it is published in CSW Update. I have to confess I'm not sure what that is. All right. And you're, you're familiar with uh, Prof Professor Garnett's and Professor Peplau, correct? Yes. All right. Thank you. And please look at page five of the, with the page numbers. and. There is a subtitle that says The Fluidity of Women's Sexuality and Sexual Orientation. Yes. And I'm going to read starting with the second sentence. It says, Scholars from many disciplines have noted that women's sexuality tends to be fluid, malleable, shaped by life experiences, and capable of change over time. Do you agree with that characterization of women's sexuality? Well, I would agree with that uh, statement that scholars from many disciplines have noted that many aspects of women's, sexu uh, women's sexuality uh, tends to be very sensitive to uh, environmental cues. This is not only related to sexual orientation or the sex of a partner, but also the frequency, 
of having sex, the types of uh, sexual behavior that are engaged in and enjoyed, uh, a number of different aspects of women's sexuality uh, have the, the research literature indicates that there is a greater sensitivity among women than among men to environmental uh, uh, influences or situational influences in many aspects of their sexuality. All right, and let's read the next sentence. It says, female sexual development is a potentially continuous, lifelong process in which multiple changes in sexual orientation are possible. Do you agree with that statement? Well, I would say that uh, depending upon exactly what you consider development, um, it, it is a, a potentially lifelong continuous process. This is the general view of all kinds of development that people are developing throughout their lives. So in that regard, sexual development is also probably a, a lifelong continuous process. Um, the idea of multiple changes in sexual orientation being possible, I would certainly say that's true. It is possible. Uh, and in some cases it, it happens, but as we've discussed a number of times, for many people, in fact most people, it doesn't seem to happen. All right, thank you. And let, let's continue then. Let's, it says, women's sexuality is responsive throughout the lifespan to a wide range of social, cognitive, and environmental influences. Women who have had exclusively heterosexual experiences may develop an attraction to other women and vice versa. Do you agree with that? Yes, I think that that's a, an accurate characterization of the uh, of the literature. All right, thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to uh, submit DIX 1010 into evidence. Your Honor, subject to the same objection uh, earlier that Professor Peplau has been here and subject to cross. Very well, uh, the witness has been examined with respect to the substance of this. Uh, I think it's appropriate to admit it at the very least take judicial notice of it under uh, uh, the evidence rule, but uh, you may proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Herrick, please turn to tab 30 in the witness binder. You'll find here a document pre-marked DIX 1229. Could you read that? Could you identify that? Um, this is an article uh, characterized as a distinguished scholar article in the journal Personal Relationships from 2001. The title is Rethinking Women's Sexual Orientation, colon, an Interdisciplinary Relationship-Focused Approach. And the author is Letitia Ann Peplau. All right, thank you. And are you familiar with this document? No, I've never seen this before. You're familiar with Professor Peplau, correct? As I've said, yes, I am. Uh, you believe she has a good reputation as a scholar in her field, correct? I believe she has a very solid reputation. All right, thank you. Please look at page five of this article. And halfway down the first column, you'll see a, a uh, subheading within person variability across time and so within person variability across time and social setting. And it reads, although some may think of sexual orientation as determined early in life and relatively unchanging from then on, growing evidence indicates that the nature of a woman's intimate relationships can change throughout her life and differ across social settings. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, again, I think this is consistent with what I've been saying. This, this can happen. All right, thank you. And please turn to pages 13 and 14. They're together. You can open them up and you'll be able to read them. And in the sentence that starts at the very bottom of the second column on page 13, Professor Peplau writes, Hazen and Diamond, and again, I believe this is the Professor Diamond that we've discussed, rejected the idea that individuals have specific gender-based images of a suitable partner and suggested instead that the search image for human mating is inherently flexible. Just as infants can form attachments to a wide range of potential caretakers, so too adults can become infatuated and bond with a range of partners. Do you agree with that statement? Or let me rephrase that. Do you agree with Hazen and Diamond's position as described here by Professor Peplow? Well, I actually don't believe I've read the article by Hazen and Diamond, so uh, I don't know that I can agree or disagree with it. 
Um, you yeah, disagree? I, I, I honestly, I, I don't believe I've read that article. So knowing exactly uh, what is involved in, in this, I mean, you have Dr. Peplau making a one sentence uh, characterization of the article. And it's not that I would uh, suspect her of doing that inaccurately, but as far as deciding whether this is something I agree with or not, I, I would really need to read the article to get the context for it. So if I were to ask you, is the idea that, that in, okay, that individuals have a search, that the search image for human mating is inherently flexible and just as infants can form attachments to a wide range of potential caretakers, so two adults can become infatuated and bond with a range of partners. If I just stated it like that, would you disagree with it? Well, you know, I think that those terms infatuated and bonding and, and the use of the terms around attachment, um, all of this suggests to me, again, without having read the article, but um, this may actually be talking uh, more about the experience of uh, love, uh, romantic love, uh, or, or very strong feelings of platonic love um, as opposed to sexual attraction. So uh, again, I'm, I'm just not sure of the, the context. Uh, you know, and I haven't read this article by Dr. Peplau, so I'm, and then she's quoting from this other article that I haven't read, so it's very difficult to, to try to comment on a, uh, two things for which I don't really have a good context. Well, I, I'm actually just asking you if you agree with the statement that's written there. And is your answer that you just can't one way or the other without knowing more? My answer is that I don't, I don't think I can without having read the entire article. All right, thank you. And, Your Honor, I'd like to offer uh, DIX 1229 into evidence. Your Honor, again, uh, this is an article that the, uh, the witness hasn't seen by a witness who was here last week. So I think it comes in under 803, um, at least under judicial notice. So we'll admit it for the record. Thank you very much. Now, please turn back to tab 14, if you would. And uh, you'll see, uh, you, here you'll find a document that we've talked about earlier today. Uh, if you could turn to page 333. And uh, under within person variation or change over time, at the second full paragraph, you'll see a line that says, further, both women's identification as lesbian, bisexual, or heterosexual, and women's actual behavior can vary over time. Now, now you agree with that, correct? I'm sorry, I haven't, I'm not sure where you are. Could you? Page 333? Yeah, I, I'm there. Uh, the second full paragraph under within person variation. Oh. Okay, okay. The first sentence says, further, both women's identification as lesbian, bisexual, or heterosexual, and women's actual behavior can vary over time. And you agree with that, correct? I think I've said that several times, that that, that can happen, yes. All right, and page 345, if you could turn there. And in the second full paragraph on the page. It's, near the, it's quite near the bottom, actually. It's a, the last full paragraph on the page. Partway through, it reads, quote, the factors shaping women's attractions and relationships vary across the life cycle. For example, the role of sexual arousal and passion may be different in the relationships of adolescents, middle-aged women, and older adults. Although some women remain in the same job throughout their life, other women make major career changes. Similarly, women's erotic and romantic attractions, sorry, women's erotic and romantic attractions can also shift and change during their lifetimes. Do you agree with that statement? With the final statement? Well, let, let's break it up. Do you agree that the factors shaping women's attractions and relationships vary across the life cycle? They can. Okay, thank you. And do you agree that women's erotic and romantic attractions can shift and change during their lifetimes? It can. They can, yes. All right, thank you. Okay, please turn, and uh, that's already in. Please turn to tab 34 in the witness binder.
And you'll find here a document pre-marked DIX 1270. You identify that document? This is the title page from an edited book called The Psychology of Sexual Orientation, Behavior, and Identity, a Handbook, edited by Lewis Diamant and Richard McAnulty. Thank you. And if you look at the inside the document, you'll see that the, there's a specific uh, chapter here. Can you identify that? Yes. Um, so this is a chapter in this 1995 book by Michael Kauth and Seth Kalishman titled Sexual Orientation and Development, colon, An Interactive Approach. All right. Thank you. Now please turn to page 82. Of the uh, of the page of the article, excuse me, and you will see that it, it in the first column. Well, it's not a. It's actually just page 82, I guess. It says, by sexual orientation, we mean the cumulative experience and interaction of erotic fantasy, romantic emotional feelings, and sexual behavior directed towards both or one gender or one or both genders. These three somewhat independent and parallel dimensions are traditionally conceived as being overlaid on the plane of sexual orientation. And, and that's similar to what we've discussed, correct? I believe so. And then it says, this model suggests that sexual orientation is not static and may vary throughout the course of a lifetime. Do you agree with that statement? Um, as I said earlier, it is possible and it may vary, yes. All right, thank you. Your Honor, I'd like to admit, I'd like to offer DIX 1270 into evidence. Very well, 1270 is admitted. Thank you. And please turn back to tab 19 in the binder. And this is something we discussed earlier today. And please turn to page 4 in this printout of this article. And please look at the last full paragraph on the bottom of the page. We, we read a little bit from the paragraph that follows. But in the last uh, full paragraph, starting with the second sentence, it reads, there is essentially no research on the longitudinal stability of sexual orientation over the adult lifespan. In other words, even if one could satisfactorily measure the complex components of sexual orientation as differentiated from other aspects of sexual identity at one point in time, it is still an unanswered question whether this measure will predict future behavior or orientation. Do you disagree with that statement? Well, um, I believe that what they're talking about here is the absence of prospective longitudinal research where the same individuals are followed over a long period of their lifetime and where ideally you would do this with a large representative sample of individuals. Um, I would say that we certainly do have retrospective accounts from individuals pointing to consistency uh, over the course of their lifetime in terms of many of these variables. And we can go back yet again to the Lauman and Gagnon study, which uh, asked about attractions and identity in the present, but asked about sexual behavior in the past. Um, so this uh, unanswered question about whether the measure will predict future behavior or orientation um, I would say, given the way they phrase this, it would be an unanswered question in that they um, don't even, are not proposing, a, I don't think, a, a particular measure that one would even use in this. Uh, and so, um, again, I would say, as I said before, that if you are trying to predict a person's future sexual behavior, um, especially if this is an adult, someone who has gotten past um, adolescence and, and maybe even young adulthood, that you would probably do best to hypothesize that their behaviors will be consistent with their current sexual orientation if, in fact, they engage in sexual behaviors. Um, I believe one of the reservations I had in my uh, 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 
my deposition was that you might not even know that the individual is going to engage in any sexual behavior. So people end up being celibate or asexual for various reasons. Okay. But I, I would just say that, again, um, it, we do have these retrospective accounts. Uh, the prospective study with a large representative sample, it's true, we don't have. All right, thank you. And now I don't think they're talking about celibacy here. I, I think they're talking about just, you know, if you can satisfactorily, even if you could satisfactorily measure the complex components of sexual orientation as differentiated from, it, from other aspects of sexual identity at one point of time, it is still an unanswered question whether this measure will predict future behavior or orientation. Do you and, disagree with that? Well, you know, and it's, it's noteworthy that one of the authors of this paper is Randall Sell, who proposed that very complicated uh, way of measuring sexual orientation. So. Um, the statement that even if one could satisfactorily measure the complex components, um, I, I think perhaps he was alluding to what I think was something he was going to be publishing in the future. I don't think he had it at the point that this paper was written. Um, but yes, as far as you know, predicting future behavior or orientation, um, we, we don't have that sort of large-scale prospective study. All right, thank you. And please look at tab 16. This is the Laumann study again. And please turn to page 310. And since we're talking about retrospective uh, data, though this is not longitudinal to be sure, starting at the bottom of 310, Last full sentence on the page. Oh, I'm sorry, 310. Or excuse me, actually, it's not a full sentence. It starts on, it's, the sentence starts at the bottom of 310 and doesn't finish till, till the, the next page. Beginning with the distribution of partners by gender in the last year, we find that 2.7% of the men had a male partner and 1.3% of the women a female partner. Of these, about three out of four report having only same gender partners in the past 12 months while the other quarter had at least one partner of each gender. Okay, are, are you familiar with those statistics? Um, yes, I, uh, I'm generally familiar with this. I, those specific statistics I wouldn't have been able to quote you from memory. All right, so that's for the last year. Then it goes on to say, in the past five years, 4.1% of the men and 2.2% of the women had, it, had at least one same-sex or same-gender partner. About half these men had both male and female partners in this time period. The women are more likely than the men to have had sex with both men and women than only same gender partners. Almost two thirds of the women reporting a female partner in the past uh, almost two thirds of the women reporting a female partner in the past five years also report a male partner. Are you familiar with those statistics, Professor Eric? Uh, generally, yes. Okay. Thank you. The proportion of the men with male partners since, the age, since age 18 who report having had only male partners declines to about 20% of the total. For women, the comparable figure is about 10%. So are you familiar with those figures? Uh, again, in, uh, in general, yes. So for one year, it was 25% of men and uh, Uh, for both, actually. And then in the past five years, it was 50% for men and two-thirds for women. Since 18, it was 20% for men and 10% for women who had had exclusively same-sex partners, correct? No, I don't think you said that correctly. Um, All right, for, let's do it one at a time. Okay. For, for the past year, um, for both men and women, of the individuals who had same-sex partners or a same-sex partner, 75% had only same-sex partners, whereas 25% had at least one opposite-sex partner, correct? Correct. For the past five years, for, all the, for men who had had a same-sex partner during that period, 50% had also had an opposite-sex partner, correct? Yes. And for women, during the five-year period, two-thirds uh, of the women who had had a same-sex partner during that period, two-thirds had also had a male partner, correct? Correct. 
and looking since age 18, of men who had male partners since 18, 80% had also had opposite sex partners, correct? Uh, yes, apparently at least one opposite sex partner. Yes, and for women, the comparable figure for since 18 is 10%. So 10, only 10% of the women who had a same-sex partner since 18 had had exclusively same-sex partners, correct? Yes. And then it says, when the time period under consideration is extended to all partners since puberty, the proportion of men with only male partners declines again to 10% of the men with any male partners, correct? That's what it says. All right, and, and are, you, you're, are you, again, you're familiar with those statistics, correct? Yes, and as I said, it, it's not terribly surprising that many lesbians and gay men at some point in their life do end up having uh, sexual relationships with a person of the other sex. And, and not just at some point in their life. Uh, in the past five years, at least half. Though I guess this is not ju this is in terms of behavior, though. As you yeah, yeah, this is just talking about all the men and women who reported any instance of same-sex behavior or of same-sex attraction or interest or of being uh, lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And again, I think it's just important to keep in mind that in this study, the people who identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual tended to be very consistent in reporting their current attractions as being to the same sex and as reporting uh, uh, having um, partners of the same sex, uh, although it is the case that, that some of them uh, earlier in life did have uh, partners of the other sex, All right. or and, at and, least and one partner of the other sex. I apologize, and, and, but this is, this is specifically talking about same-sex partners, not just attraction, correct? This is conduct. This is, this is about sexual behavior. Yes, thank you. All right, and that is already admitted. So please turn to tab... Well, actually, the, the bad news, Your Honor, is I have another binder. The good news is it's much thinner than this one. Uh, it's much thinner than this one. <coughs> I see. So we can put this one aside, can we? I, I may come back to it, so don't put it too far up to the side. I see. Right. And uh, Honor, uh, permission to approach? Yes. Thank you. Small, very small, but many taps. Is this the uh, last binder with this witness? All right. I am happy to report it as the last binder. Okay, and in the second witness binder, if you could turn to tab 35. Okay. And you'll find here a document uh, pre-marked DIX 856. Yes. And can you identify this document? Um, this is an article from the journal Developmental Psychology from 2008. The author is Lisa Diamond, and the title is Female Bisexuality from Adolescence to Adulthood, colon, Results from a 10-Year Longitudinal Study. Are you familiar with the study? Uh, I am familiar with the study, yes. Okay, thank you. And, and again, you're familiar with Professor Diamond. Do you, I'm, I still, I'm still familiar with Professor yeah. Diamond, yes. <laughs> you haven't forgotten her yet. Not yet. <laughs> right, thank you. All right, now this is a 10-year longitudinal study of a group of non-heterosexual women, correct? Um, this particular article, I believe, only focuses on non-heterosexual women. In her larger study, there were some heterosexual women, but I don't believe she reports on them in this paper. All right, thank you. And please turn to page 9. You'll see in, under results in the... Well, st let's re it's just reading under change in identity. Uh, starting with the second line, in all, 32% of women changed identity, identities from T1 to T2, 25% from T2 to T3, 30% from T3 to T4, and 28% from T4 to T5. And those are different points along the 10 years. And then the next section says, by the 10-year point, 67% of participants had changed their identities at least once since T1 
and 36% had changed identities more than once. So only 33% of the women she studied retained the same sexual orientation across the 10-year period, correct? Um, you know, in this study, she began by recruiting uh, about 89 uh, women who did not identify as being heterosexual. And so she recruited women who called themselves lesbians, women who called themselves bisexuals, and also women who said that they were uncertain about their sexuality or were questioning their sexuality. And so what she found were these patterns of women changing the labels that they attach to their sexuality. Um, she, in her book, makes the point that, in her view, this did not reflect a change in the woman's sexual orientation. And if you read uh, her articles for this, this study uh, in a, as a, on a whole, um, what you see is that the patterns of sexual attraction reported, the women, reported by the women tended to remain fairly stable. And it was the case that most of the change in labeling was among the women who were initially calling themselves bisexual or those who were initially unlabeled. So there was movement back and forth between those two categories. Some bisexual women came to call themselves lesbians. Some bisexual women came to call themselves heterosexual. Um, as I understand it, there were very few women who called themselves lesbian in the first place who called themselves heterosexual at the end. I, I honestly don't know if there were any who did that. But there were some women who identified as lesbian at the beginning who subsequently, after the study went on for 10 years, um, and they had gotten out of college and had gone, uh, you know, were more in their later 20s, um, uh, adopted a label of bisexual for themselves. All right, thank you. And so this is a case where the identity was changing, but not the attraction. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think, uh, yeah, actually, I, I think that she often focuses more on, on the word labeling more so than identity, but, but yes. Right. Your Honor, I'd like to introduce, or, uh, I'd like to offer DIX 856. All right. 856. All right. Thank you. Please turn to... Uh, tab 35A, and here you'll find a exhibit premark DIX 626. Can you identify that document? Um, this is an article with several authors. The first author is Nigel Dixon, D-I-C-K-S-O-N. Uh, it's titled, Same-Sex Attraction in a Birth Cohort. Prevalence and Persistence in Early Adulthood. It was published in 2003 in the journal Social Science and Medicine. Right, thank you. And uh, if you look at page 1611, you'll see that this is a longitudinal study that looked at 451 men and 436 women who reported their current sexual attraction at both ages 21 and 26, uh, correct? Yeah, I'm sorry, could you say what page you were uh, on? It's on page 1611. Oh, okay. And you'll see uh, under sexual attraction at age 21 and 26, you'll see that this is a longitudinal study with the 451 men and 436 women who reported their current sexual attractions at both ages 21 and 26. And then on page 1612, under the discussion in the second paragraph, and you see some fairly complex figures over that showing the various permutations of change. But it says, the findings also revealed a surprising degree of change over time. 10% of men and nearly a quarter of the women reported same-sex attraction at any time, but this nearly halved for current attraction at age 26. The changes were not just in one direction. The instability was most marked for women, with a greater movement away from exclusively heterosexual attraction from age 21 to 26 than among men. And I'm sorry, I, I, could you tell me again where you're reading from? I apologize. It was the first full paragraph in the first column on 1612. Oh, okay, okay. I'll give you just a moment okay, to glance I, I, at that. I'm there now, yeah, I found you. Do, do those changes in any way surprise you? or? Well... Uh, as I, I, I don't believe I'm familiar with this paper, but I am familiar with earlier papers that came from this study. 
And um, my recollection from the, one of the earlier papers was that I was concerned because in this rather large sample, there were only nine males and I believe 11 women, 11 females, who um, identified as being um, lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And so there were problems with generalizing from such small numbers. Um, but as I said earlier, um, adolescence and even into early adulthood are times of identity formation and development for many people, most people. And uh, so in that sense, I wouldn't be surprised to see some changes in uh, how people understand their sexuality as they progress through their teens and into their early 20s. Right. Thank you. And, and Your Honor, I'd like to offer DIX 26. Well. All right. Please turn to page, or to tab 35B, if you would. Can you, and here you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 666. And can you identify oh. that? Sorry. 666? DIX 666, it's at 35B. Okay. Can you identify that document? Yes. Yes. All right. Could, could, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, would I? I? I asked you if I, I... Never mind. I misheard you. No, that's all right. Go ahead. Um, this is an article published in the Journal of Sex Research in 1997. Uh, multiple authors. The first of them is Joseph Stokes. And it's titled, Predictors of Movement Toward Homosexuality, A Longitudinal Study of Bisexual Men. All right. Thank you. And if you look at page 308, uh, in the third column, you'll find that in this, th this is a, a one-year longitudinal study, I suppose. And it says, uh, on a self-rated seven-point sexual orientation schedule, scale, 73 respondents moved towards homosexuality, 34%. 37 moved towards heterosexuality, 17 percent, and 106 did not change, 49 percent, from time one to time two, correct? And I'm sorry, I'm just trying to catch up to you. Can you tell me again where you're reading from? For page 308, okay. the top of the third column. Okay, I'm there. And as, so of, of this of this sample of 73 uh, percent moved towards homosexuality, 34% moved towards heterosexuality, and 49% did not change. And this is a one-year longitudinal study of bisexual men. Do those numbers surprise you at all? Well, and of course it's important to remember that this is not a representative sample. Um, but if, uh, just in looking at it quickly, and I, I believe I may have read this paper at one point, but not for a long time, um, they were recruiting, as they say, relatively young men, men in their late teens and in their 20s, um, who said that they had had sex with a man and also sex with a woman. They had to meet both of those criteria in the past three years. Um, and so it, it appears, and I'm, I'm just doing this very quickly uh, as I glance through it, but it would appear that... Um, they were recruiting people based mainly on uh, their sexual behaviors. Uh, and so um, the idea, again, that um, in early adulthood, uh, some people who had engaged in sexual behavior with both men and women would at some point shift toward uh, being exclusively with either men or women um, does not particularly surprise me. Um, and it appears that roughly half of them did not change uh, during that time period. All right, thank you. And um, Your Honor, I'd like to offer DIX 666. Very well. Thank you. Now we've talked about change generally, Professor Herrick, and no one in this case is suggesting that gay men and lesbians should be forced to change their sexual orientation or even that they should attempt to do so. But is, is it your opinion that a gay man or lesbian who wishes to change his or her sexual orientation can never do so? 
It's my opinion that the current research does not indicate that interventions that are designed for that purpose uh, have been shown to be effective using the criteria that I described this morning. Um, it certainly is the case that there have been many people who uh, most likely because of societal stigma uh, wanted very much to change their sexual orientation and were not able to do so. Uh, whether or not it is something that could possibly happen, um, I don't know. I think that, that we simply don't have data that indicate that any of the interventions that have been developed for this purpose are effective or safe. All right, and, and stepping back from the rather technical definition of effective that you've offered, uh, which involved generalizability and uh, absence of harm in a, in a variety of things, if I recall, and just speaking in ordinary language, do you believe it's impossible for someone to change their sexual orientation who wishes to? Um, I would be reluctant to say that anything is impossible. So I, I would not say it's impossible. And there are self-reports of people who say that that has happened, correct? There are indeed self-reports of people who say that has happened. Right, thank you. And is it your opinion that such attempts are always harmful? That interventions to change people's sexual orientation are always harmful? No, again, as I said earlier, we don't have experimental data on either that would suggest that these treatments are effective, nor do we have experimental data showing that they are consistently harmful. We do have uh, some data from experimental studies showing harm to some of the participants, and we do have self-reports of people who believed or perceived that they were harmed as a result of going through one or more of these interventions. And uh, you, you said two things. You said self-reports of harm. Yes. And you said before that you said some data. Yes. All right, and, and what, what particularly do you have in mind there? Well, if you read the research reports, uh, most of them published in the 1970s, 19, mostly in the 1970s, I believe, um, what you see is that there are reports in those studies uh, that some people who were uh, experiencing uh, uh, some sort of intervention or therapy or treatment designed to change them from homosexual to heterosexual um, experienced or, or were observed to have uh, clinical depression or uh, anxiety or uh, other sorts of negative uh, 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 experiences or, or negative psychological states, um, you know, that, that were, that happened in conjunction with going through these treatment programs. All right. But again, the, the data is quite limited, correct, in, in bo both with respect to whether it can happen and to whether it's, har it's harmful. Is that correct? Well, the data that are available don't suggest that these, <clears throat> excuse me, that these interventions are effective, meaning that they work most of the time with the people they're supposed to work with and that they do so safely. Yes, no, thank you. We, I, I believe I understand your technical definition of effective. L let's turn to uh, tab 35C of the binder. And can you identify, you'll find here a document pre-marked PX1503, and can you identify that document? Um, this is an article by Robert Spitzer published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior in 2003. Um, the title is, Can Some Gay Men and Lesbians Change Their Sexual Orientation? Question mark. 200 participants reporting a change from homosexual to heterosexual orientation. Thank you. And now you're familiar with the author, uh, correct? I don't know the author personally. I know who he is. And he's a very prominent psychiatrist who is certainly considered to be an expert in his field, correct? Well, he's a very prominent psychiatrist who is considered to be an expert on clinical diagnosis. And in fact, he was involved in uh, many of the uh, deliberations surrounding changes to the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. And, and by that you mean the decision to remove homosexuality as a disorder, correct? Well, he, he was involved in many other aspects of the DSM as well. Yeah, thank you. And he was, he was very closely involved in the process that led to the removal of homosexuality from the diagnostic and statistical manual, correct? I believe that he was chairing or was at least a prominent member of the committee of the American Psychiatric Association convened on that question.
And, and please turn to page 413. And please look in the second column, the, the first full paragraph. And it writes, this study indicates that some gay men and lesbians following reparative therapy report that they have made major changes from a predominantly homosexual orientation to a predominantly heterosexual orientation. Now I understand that you have, in your work, you have raised questions about whether that finding can be generalized in any meaningful way, correct? Well, you know, that sentence, I think, um, accurately states what he found, which is that some gay men and lesbians report that they made major changes um, and they did that after they had been through one of these reparative therapy interventions. So I wouldn't take issue with that statement. What I would take issue with is going beyond that statement to say that this study actually shows that it was those interventions that brought about this uh, self-perceived change in sexual orientation and that these same individuals who were highly religious and in fact belonged to uh, various organizations that were promoting the idea of behavior change for homosexuals, um, it, that they wouldn't have changed simply on their own without this intervention. Uh, that, the study doesn't show that. All right, thank you. But you don't question the specific finding that we just read, correct? He, people reported to him that they felt they had changed. All right, thank you. And, and Your Honor, I, I would like to offer PX 1503 into evidence. Well. And now, is you, do you question whether those reports from the individuals were accurate? Well, the problem is that we know that people are not always aware of their mental processes, and they're not always aware of why things happen or why they do things. Uh, this is the reason why when we're trying to test the effectiveness of a treatment or a drug, we use an experimental design, which means that uh, we randomly assign people to various groups and we then observe before and after their participation in the group exactly what has happened on the variable of interest. Um, we also, I think, are generally familiar with things such as the placebo effect, that people will sometimes, in a pharmaceutical study, get a sugar pill and they'll feel better or some of their symptoms will go away. Uh, but they didn't actually receive the drug, they just received a placebo. Uh, so this is just an illustration of how uh, people are, are not really necessarily able to tell you why uh, things have happened to them or why things have changed sometimes. Now, now in your, your studies, haven't you relied on self-reporting? Yes. And do you take individuals at their word, correct? Well, I try not to, usually anyway, ask questions that would require people to report things that they're not um, capable of reporting. Um, but uh, I would say that in my research where, in the situations where I've tried to show cause and effect, uh, I've tried to use an experimental design for that purpose. All right. For example, when you ask individuals whether they experience little or no choice with respect to their sexual orientation, you take them at their word, correct? Um, I take them at their word that they experience little or no choice. Uh, yes. I, I don't think that's a matter of them saying, for example, how they became lesbian or gay or bisexual. Uh, it's rather just simply asking them, have they experienced conscious choice in this regard? And uh, what most of the lesbians and gay men said was that no, they didn't experience conscious choice. All right, thank you. Let's uh, please turn to tab 35D in the witness binder. And you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 1014. And I'm sure you'll be able, you can identify this document, correct? Well, this is, uh, actually it's not on here. This appears to me to be um, an actual copy of a letter that Sigmund Freud wrote to uh, a woman from the United States that had uh, written to him about her son being homosexual. Um, and it's often referred to as the letter to an American mother. I believe this was published quite a long time ago in a uh, psychiatric journal, but I don't remember which one and the reference is not, it's not here. Thank you. And fortunately for us, there's a 
a typewritten copy of the letter if you look to uh, page 787, so we don't have to try and read the handwriting. Now, please look at uh, reading from the type, typewritten version, the first full paragraph on page 787. And this is Freud responding to, to an American mother, as you said. Yes. By asking me if I can help, you mean, I suppose, if I can abolish homosexuality and make normal heterosexuality take its place. The answer is, in a general way, we cannot promise to achieve it. In a certain number of cases, we succeed in developing the blighted germs of heterosexual tendencies, which are present in every homosexual. In the majority of cases, it is, it is no more possible. It is a question of the quality and the age of the individual. The result of treatment cannot be predicted. Now, do you believe Freud was mistaken when he said that in a certain number of cases, we succeed in developing what, what, what he described as the blighted germs of heterosexual tendencies? Well... You know, Freud was writing this in 1935, and uh, at that time uh, there were certainly psychoanalysts who attempted to cure homosexuality, although it's a pro I think it's, it's relevant to note that in this letter in the first paragraph, Freud said it, homosexuality is assuredly no advantage, but it is nothing to be ashamed of, no vice, no degradation. It cannot be classified as an illness. We consider it to be a function of this, a variation of the sexual function produced by a certain arrest of sexual development. He goes on to list people like Michelangelo and Leonardo who were, who are homosexuals <coughs> and says it is a great injustice to persecute homosexuality as a crime and cruelty too. In the context of him, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, correct. So, so Freud plainly did not have animus towards, towards homosexuals, correct? Right. And what he was telling uh, the mother who wrote this was that, in the last paragraph, what analysis can do for your son runs in a different line. If he's unhappy, neurotic, torn by conflicts, inhibited in his social life, analysis may bring him harmony, peace of mind, full efficiency, whether he remains a homosexual or gets changed. Um, Freud, I, I believe, I, I'm not a Freud scholar, but I believe that Freud actually was very pessimistic about the likelihood of psychoanalysis being able to change a person's sexual orientation. Uh, his comment there about the germs of heterosexuality are consistent with Freud's general view of human sexuality. Uh, his theory was that all people are inherently bisexual uh, and that uh, they become heterosexual or homosexual only in the course of their development. Uh, all right, thank you. But and that's that is certainly the the other parts of the letter. And I. But he specifically says. In a certain number of cases, we succeed. Do you believe he was mistaken, misrepresenting? Well, you know, there's a real problem with looking at um, uh, intervention attempts by psychoanalysts, uh, not, not just Freud, but by other psychoanalysts. Because typically, you have a situation uh, in which the uh, analyst is the person who's, if you will, both administering the treatment and monitoring its success. Uh, and so the analyst wants very much for this to succeed. Often the patient wanted very much for this to succeed. And in that sort of situation, there's a great possibility for the patient to um, indicate to the analyst, either consciously or unintentionally, um, that, that he or she is changing. And uh, that may not, in fact, be happening. Uh, so the, the standards for how we evaluate the effectiveness of an intervention are were not followed by uh, Freud or by other analysts to whom he might have been referring in that in that letter. All right, thank you. But do you think so? Do you think it's impossible that he might have been both accurate and honest in making that statement? Well, I didn't mean to imply that Freud was dishonest in any way. Uh, in terms of accuracy, I would say that he might have perceived this as being an effective change, but whether or not that would pass muster with current standards of, of uh, experimental research would be a, an open question. Thank you. Now, Your Honor, I have a little bit more, though. It's a fairly good breaking point if you, if... Why don't we plow on? Yes, Your Honor. Um, All right. Your Honor? Well, let's ask the witness. <laughs> I was just wondering enough. how long we were likely to plow on. Uh, well, let's... <laughs> I, let's <laughs> I may request the break otherwise. It, it, that's a good question. How much longer do you think you have, Mr. Well, Pierce? it depends in part on the length of the answers, to be honest. But I, I think probably between a, 
probably about a half hour to 45 minutes. Rick? Um, I'll... I'll stay pat for the moment. I'll, I'll be all okay. right. If that I'll, I'll, situation I'll, changes, I'll well, do my I'd best. be happy to take a break. Thank sure you. We all would be. Why don't we just stand up anyway? And, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a very good idea. We'll have some redirect, and I will keep it as brief as possible, but just for our planning purposes. I'm thinking no more than half an hour. Oh, I understand. You want to take a break? <laughs> I can All right. back very quickly. Uh, in fact, if you give me a head start, I'll be Council, we, uh, Council? we are going to take a break. Okay. <laughs> Thank Five you. minutes. <laughs> Much appreciated, Your Honor. Ha, 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 ha.